Welcome to episode 54 of the Hunt Back Country podcast, presented to you by Exo Mountain Gear. On this week's show, our guest is Chris Maxwell, and we dive into the topic of guided hunts. Yeah, guided hunts. I know, I know what you're thinking. You're a do-it-yourself guy, public land guy, over-the-counter guy. Guess what? I'm right there with you, and guess what? So is our guest. But there's times and there's a place for a guided hunt, and you'll hear about that today. More importantly, even if you don't think a guided hunt is in your future, if you hunt long enough, I bet that it might be. There's times when you get into certain species or want to hunt certain areas, and going guided is the only way to go. So whether this is a topic that you're interested in now or just something that you think might possibly could be in your future, you are going to learn some essential information tonight about how to start that process and what to even consider on a guided hunt. I, like you, am years away from considering a guided hunt, but I thoroughly enjoyed this episode and learned a lot for what to think through down the road. Big thanks to Chris for joining us, and big thanks to you, the listener, for your feedback that you can always send us at any time to podcast at exomontgear.com, and huge thank you for the reviews on iTunes. If you're enjoying this show, please consider going to iTunes and leaving us a review. It helps tremendously. Okay, we'll wrap up with some more after the show, but for now, here's our discussion with Chris Maxwell. All right, well, Chris, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight? Good, thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks for coming on with us. Um, Excited to talk about a bunch of topics tonight. Uh, Just to get started off, could you kind of introduce yourself to the listeners, um, you know, give us a little bit of background on hunting history and whatever personal history you'd like to share. It's relevant. Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, I'm probably different than uh, most of your guests. I'm from uh, Canada and lucky enough to be in Alberta where we can uh, hunt the backcountry and sheep and whatnot uh, with over-the-counter tags. Um, I cut my teeth, I guess, Growing up uh, in Saskatchewan, primarily hunting uh, whitetail and mule deer and antelope, like uh, most people from the prairie regions do. And um, after I got finished school, I moved out to Alberta here, and I guess I haven't looked back, so been here ever since. Yeah, there's some uh, monster bucks up there in the plains of Saskatchewan, right? Yeah, like, um, yeah, just uh, growing up, like, you know, guys shooting 160 inch deer you know probably don't get a second look most of the time and um definitely have seen a lot of 180 plus type white tails and lots of friends that have got some really exceptional deer and stuff so it's a great place um to come from if you're a deer hunter for sure yeah that's awesome yeah so you, you know, you mentioned sheep. You actually uh, have hunted sheep quite a bit, as you mentioned. You can do it yourself. Uh, you have multiple years of experience doing that. What was kind of that learning curve going from the plains of Saskatchewan to then getting into sheep country and trying to figure those critters out? Yeah, so uh, when I first moved to Alberta, um, you know, I had no interest in sh- hunting sheep whatsoever. And Um, you know, I thought, oh, maybe a moose or an elk one day would be great. But, you know, a sheep never even crossed my mind. And uh, a really good friend of mine actually had uh, um, worked for an outfitter for a few years when he was just out of school and I reconnected with him. And um, he had worked up in the Wilmore and that's a a huge wilderness area um, in northern Alberta. And like there's no development in there. It's basically foot and horse access only and it's like tens and tens of thousands of acres and so we just he talked me into uh going with him on a sheep hunt but it wasn't going to be in an area where he had worked with his outfitter we were going to go to this new area that he'd always wanted to try and um look good to him and uh long story short we packed our stuff up with probably uh everything but the kitchen thing or i had everything but the kitchen sink uh th- things that i thought like well just in case and this is a nice to have so i you know went in there with a pretty uh ignorant really with like 80 90 pound backpack and <laughs> um, don't worry it's only sheep country yeah That's exactly no <laughs> and uh long story short uh, the trip was a disaster from the time we uh 
hit the trailhead till the time we decided to turn back and you know I, I don't think we even really made it to the mountain at that uh we could see like it was so close we could see it but um like my friend i was hunting with there he had an accident and hurt himself and and then i was getting worn out from carrying this ridiculously heavy pack so we we're like after about two days we were turned back and then I, that's a, when I realized, you know, sheep hunting isn't easy. This isn't going to be like a deer hunt where you just go out and get one. Yeah. Um, it was way more difficult than I thought it was going to be. And then I was on a mission to, um, figure things out and hunt them properly and learn more and go back and try it again. And, you know, um, I think it was a solid seven years before I finally decided to pull the trigger on one and uh i could have gotten a couple earlier but they were just young rams they're illegal but they were not really what you want to take for a sheep like um i was more interested in getting an older older mature ram and being fortunate enough to have over-the-counter tags i was able to just pass on some of those younger rams without really regretting it later and um yeah, so yeah. that's kind of how I got into it anyways. And like I said, the first trip was a complete debacle, and I <laughs> sure had a lot to learn coming from. I think from. that's the first for most of us, regardless <laughs> yeah. of the yeah. species, you know? Well, yeah, for so. sure. Like the first, oh, I'm going to head into the wilderness and figure this thing out, and it can't be that hard, you know? Yeah, and, and I probably made the number one biggest rookie mis- – well, I guess like my friend that I was with, he had hunted out in there – you know, a lot and he should have known better, but I, we made like probably the biggest mistake any first time backcountry hunter could make is we went back there. We had a pocket full of tags. Cause like I was mentioning a lot of our stuff's on general season. So deer, elk, et cetera. So we bought, we brought like probably enough food for three solid days. And our idea was, Oh, well we really want to get an elk as well. So we'll, you know, make a kill right away when we get into our base camp and <laughs> kind of rely on that, right? And Just sustenance hunting. Yeah, so thus, even if we would have made it back where we wanted to go, we wouldn't have uh, been able to stay there very long. So you Just carry the uh, elk with you as you hunt and look for sheep, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, yeah, like I said, it was, you know, we were pretty young at the time and uh, definitely inexperienced and um didn't know what we didn't know yeah mm-hmm. so a couple of quick questions that you know it's kind of popped in my head about what you came up was one you mentioned the size and you passed on some younger rams i'm just curious with these uh general season over the counter tags as a resident is there any sort of restriction on age class uh size or anything above um so in alberta where i do like most of my sheep hunting um there's no age restriction but there is a uh, curl restriction so it has to be at least four fifths curl okay and what that means is like the just to describe it with like uh simply is the tip of the horn and the front base need to be at the front of the eye yeah um so you know on a big horn that not necessarily the easiest thing to get either just because the older sheep do broom so mm-hmm. heavy so mm-hmm. if if you get a you can see or a lot of guys shoot young rams just because that lamb tip um isn't broke off and you know you might even get a five-year-old that's a full curl but he's not a very old sheep and um it's really not the kind of ram you want to take out of the population so if you can find a truly like eight year plus old ram um, that makes that four fifths requirement. That's a that's a pretty good sheep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on that four fifths requirement, is there like a way to do an exact measurement on that, or is it kind of just subjective to? I mean, you're you're in the field and you're guessing, and you know what happens if you're off by a quarter of an inch. If you're off by a quarter inch, your worst nightmares will come true. <laughs> um, they, uh, some like I know in BC. Um, the, if uh, you turn yourself in, you know, there's a little bit of leeway, but in Alberta, they're pretty strict on it. Like if you're um, short, you are in a lot of trouble and you usually wow. end up with a court date and a big fine. So okay. um, a lot of rams are shot like right on right on the line um, or not much past that four fifths. But I mean, like you're 
you're spending some serious time behind the glass before you make that call if it's that close. So wow. um, you yeah. want to be very sure that <laughs> what you're what you're taking is is, is going to yeah. yeah is legal and going to make it. And um, most guys I talk to, like unless it's like you know you look at it and it's like a no brainer, they'll probably look at a ram for two to two and a half hours before they decide to go after it and and okay. uh, make sure it's legal and look at it from every angle and yeah. um, both sides. Because usually one side's broomed a little heavier than the other, but um, um, the long side, you want to make good and sure that when you bring it in to get registered, there's no questions whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Makes, so. makes spending three grand on a spotting scope a pretty easy decision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like uh, That's probably the most important um, tool you have in the field uh, yeah. for sure is that spotting scope like that's one place I don't recommend saving money or weight on right if, yeah so but very cool one other quick question I'm sure we could probably turn this topic into an episode alone but you know just I got to thinking of it because you mentioned you know your friend had this area that he wanted to go check out when I picture steep country I mean you just think you know, super high country, steep, um, just, you know, shale, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. What is it that you are looking for when you're scouting an area for sheep um, in terms of terrain or habitat features? Or is it simply a matter of getting in there, covering ground, and seeing where they are? Um, I probably like most uh, modern-day back uh, country guys and check out Google Earth first. And what you're really looking for is um, high alpine meadows with steep cliffs for esca and escape terrain. Um, wherever I've found rams um, in particular, there's always an escape route and cliffs that they can get to easily from that uh, alpine meadows. And uh, I've been to, into areas that I thought, oh, this would be the absolute perfect sheep uh habitat and whatnot and you get there and there's not a sheep to be found there's usually some elk or whatever wandering around but there's never any sheep and when i've really gone back and looked at my pictures and whatnot it really um dawned on me that if they don't have that cliffy area and the escape terrain they're not going to be there regardless of how good the habitat is so mm -hmm. um that's kind of the first thing i look for and uh um, our mountains here when you're going into them you're typically going up or you're following like uh, um, a horse or a game trail up a river valley to the headwaters and then once you get off to the headwaters or to the area that you want to hunt then that's when you kind of get off the off the uh, valley floor i guess and uh, so sometimes you're really like if the depending on how thick the forest is you're really walking blind and really relying on your map to know exactly how far you've gone in before you um, kind of break out of that valley floor up into the high country. So, yeah. What's kind of the, the average distance you got to do on most of your hunts? Um, on the DIY stuff on foot, um, boy, I've gone as little as four miles and, oh man, up to over 20. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get pretty deep, uh, now, unless you are hunting with a partner and really know what you're getting into. I don't recommend going that deep typically, just because if you do get something, getting it out's a whole nother, yeah, whole another issue <laughs> altogether. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so after like six, seven years of hunting sheep DIY, passing some, and then getting a ram you actually ventured into guided hunts and that's a bit you know what we want to talk about tonight from several aspects but first why did you make that jump after being uh you know a do-it-yourself hunter for all these years and really get into going guided yeah so the biggest reason i kind of started looking looking into using an outfitter was i just didn't have time to um do my own scouting properly in an area and especially like with these backcountry areas like it's not like you can drive the pickup down the road and um you know get off a little ways and pull up the spotting scope like you're you're committed for at least two three days to go into an area here and 
and scout things out and um you know with uh, my job i was just getting busier and busier and then you know children come and you just don't have the time to spend in there um the other thing i found too that those that the older i got doing the diy stuff um it's just harder and harder to carry more weight to make camp comfortable and um you know using some of these guide services or drop camps you have a horse you've got horses and um you can actually have a nice wall tent with maybe like a little wood stove in it and you can bring good food and not just eat in mountain house um it just like and when you get there too you're just not as tired or worn out um when you start hunting when you have the horses available and stuff so that's kind of how i got into it and um I had one real kind of bad uh, DIY backpack experience that got me um, kind of investigating that stuff, and it was actually a dull sheep trip in Alaska. And um, I shouldn't say it was a DIY. It was guided, but it was basically DIY. We were on backpacks for 21 days. And uh, by day 21, I was pretty <laughs> pretty tired and uh you know, that was just an incredible amount of time to be hiking around the mountains with nothing but your backpack and eating mountain house. And by the time we got out there, I think I was on the last uh, notch in my belt because we'd lost so much weight. But uh, yeah, I can um, imagine. Yeah, that was pretty pretty intense trip. So I started looking into, uh, um, like I said, um, guides and outfits that had horses and seeing what it kind of cost to do that. So. Yeah. So you've kind of touched on it, but obviously there's varying levels of assistance, if you will, from a fully guided hunt where the, the hunting process is actually guided, Yeah. you know, even to something that's, you know, essentially a drop camp and that's consistent up there. And know that that's the case for lower 48, you know, if you go to mm-hmm. look at an elk hunt, for example, you can get a drop camp, you can get a fully guided hunt. There's variations in between, but yeah, that's consistent up there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, uh, at home here in Alberta, there's a, uh, quite a few outfits um, that offer um, locals drop camp options, and um, some of them will actually even bring you in and set up the camp and stay there and tend the horses and camp. And then if you get something, they'll come out and um, pick it, like you know, help you get it off the mountain and back to camp. And and then there's some that you're basically on a guided hunt, but it's costing you a fraction of the cost because you have your own. Uh, um, tag in your hand and they don't have to use one of their uh, sheep allocations yeah. um, on you so um, yeah there's quite a few different options um, but like I said I I really like if it's up to me especially the older I'm getting I really just like having the use of uh, horses and good meals um, like you know being able to pack in good food and um, more than just mountain house every day I guess so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure so on the on the side of a fully guided hunt, we actually have a guide to assist you in the hunting yep. process. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, pride in guys who are uh, do-it-yourself hunters, but you know, especially for us guys in the lower 48, if we wanted to get into species like sheep, I mean, the fact is the opportunities um, expand dramatically if you can go guided, right? Yeah, um, for sure. So there's this you know, there's this idea, and it sounds ridiculous to say it out loud, but I've heard so many hunters either say it blatantly or echo the thoughts that you know going on a guided hunt is guaranteeing success or it's you know it's taking the chance out of the chase or what have you can you kind of just speak to that and still give us some realities of how difficult it is to still hunt even if you're fully guided yeah so guided is definitely not guaranteed um you know, I think I think if I was going to say there was a guaranteed guided hunt, it would have to be maybe a black bear hunt or maybe a white-tailed deer hunt over a feeder, but that's as close as to guaranteed as you're going to get. If you're actually going backcountry hunting, it's still, um, it's really just hunting. And, um, you know, you're, what you're relying on the guide for is his knowledge, local knowledge of the area. So it's typically, like especially in these sheep hunts, Um, if you're going to BC or the Yukon or Alaska, you definitely are not going there beforehand on several scouting trips to figure the area out. So you're really relying on the guide for knowledge of the area, where to look, 
Um, and you know, it's a different species for most guys too. Like the average guy doesn't hunt sheep every year. They're lucky to hunt them once or twice in a lifetime if they get the tag and hunting sheep is like hunting a deer. It's just like not hunting an elk. It's not like hunting any other species. So their specialized kind of hunting skills or knowledge that you're relying on as well. And if you are lucky enough to pull a once in a lifetime uh, sheep tag, I don't think you want to go out there and try to years to um, pull your tag. Um, but that being said, um, I've got several friends that are guides in BC and Alberta and the Yukon, and um, they all have the same. They all they all say the same thing. They say, you know, the the hunt is for the hunter is really what he makes it. If he wants to just hang back at camp and just be the trigger man, so. But uh, more often than not, especially on the sheep hunts, the guys that are coming to hunt them want to do participate in the hunt. They want a glass. They want to look for sheep. They want to try to find them. Um, they want to be there every step of the way with the guides. So um, on these guided trips, I think a lot of it depends on the person going. Like if you want to, you can make it as hard or as easy as you want. And when I say as easy as you want, um, you know, I've heard lots of stories about guys that just want to sit in camp until the guides actually found an animal for them to go and see. But um, um, most of the guys I know that have ever went on any kind of guided trip have tried to be active participants for sure. So, yeah. So, just diving into it, there's so much we can cover on this, but. What do we begin to look for and begin to consider as we uh, plan an outfitted or guided hunt and specifically when we're weighing options on, you know, the various outfitters and guides to go with? I mean, what are some of the key questions we should be asking as we do our research? Well, that's a great question because when I first started looking into this stuff, um, you know, it seemed like there was the same service offered from you know price points all over the map and i couldn't really figure out why is this guy so much cheaper than that guy and why is this guy so much more expensive than this other guy it looks like you're getting the same thing um, but when you really start diving into it you kind of get what you pay for just like anything else so um, a few of the questions you'll want to ask is number one like how are you accessing the area like is it horse is it atv is it plane um, is it riverboat um, cause you know, some guys they're, they want a horseback hunt or some guys aren't comfortable with horses. Some guys want to show up in a pickup truck. You know, it's, you really got to f- find out how they're getting to their area. Um, another question is, you know, what kind of camp do you have? Is it cat? Cause, uh, what I've found is a lot of the pictures on some of these websites aren't necessarily what's there with when you, once you get to camp. So, you know, you really want to find out, um, are we staying in a cabin? Are we hunting from the cabin? Are we hunting from um, wall tents? Is it backpack-style tents? Um, you know, really, what are the accommodations? And then the other one, big one, is food. Like, are we eating Mountain House three meals a day? Um, are we having Mountain House occasionally? Are we eating steak? that's a really important aspect too and a lot of people um i don't think really think about that piece of it but uh you know as you guys know if you're backpack hunting eating at the mountain house you're kind of starving to death every day you just can't eat you just can't eat enough food right so oh yeah um um yeah it's really important to know what you're getting for your money um the other piece too is um knowing the area that that outfitter operates so are you relying planning on relying on him to bring you into this area and to kind of know where things are or are you, do you have a specific spot he will you want that guy to take you um if you have this very specific spot you want to go and hunt uh you know a drop camp is probably the best option for that kind of a hunter because you can say take me here the guy can come and 
drop you off, they can make plans for them to stay and tend your camp for you or plan for them to come back in you know, a week and pick you up or whatnot. But, um, you know, I, I tend to try to figure out exactly where I want to go before I go into a place. So I'm not relying on someone else to hopefully take me to a good spot. But, uh, um, yeah, so for, drop camp is probably – good option for a guy that really knows where they want to go and get to but just maybe can't get there um on foot um for whatever reason that might be yeah so speak a bit about uh pricing because i mean as you kind of mentioned there's prices all over the map but i've noticed as well just on some very rudimentary research that you know, a guide will price their hunts much differently. Um, you know, doing things like a, a flat fee for essentially getting you there and then, you know, trophy fees and add ons based on the species you take versus paying up front for, you know, certain species included. I mean, kind of talk us through the different pricing options um, for things, you know, like what animals you take as well as the post hunt yep. care of those trophies and yep. uh, other fees. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Um yeah, this well, this could be a whole episode on its own, but um, <laughs> I'm sure. uh, yeah. So if but just you give are, us you know an idea of what to look for because it's I mean it's you know yeah. it's just overwhelming. Yeah, if if uh, if uh, you are going on a fully one hundred percent guided trip with an outfitter, like you know, say it's not in your home state or province, and, and um, you're just basically showing up and doing the trip. Um, I've done a couple of those trips because I've hunted sheep uh, in a few other places. And um, what I would say is get um, the base price of a trip for a single species. And then anything extra, just have preset uh, trophy fees if that's what you're going to do. Um, we, you know, some guys like to negotiate an all in price with like two or three species in it. But um, what I've found is t- it, talking to quite a few different people is if you do that up front typically you don't get two or three species but if you got them on more of like a trophy type basis you're um you know that you're probably going to be a little more successful and and if you're not you're not out anything extra um so that's what i would personally recommend anyways other guys have different opinions but um uh, the other thing too, when you're negotiating some of this stuff, you really got to find out what's included. So, um, if there's a charter flight involved, is that extra or is that included? Um, the other piece too, like you said, you're mentioning the, uh, after hunt trophy care, um, myself, I always pack it, all my stuff with me and bring it home. Um, I never leave it there. I know lots of guys like the outfitter to handle it. Um, just because it's easier when you're at the end of the hunt just to jump on the plane and head home and, you know, not have to worry about um, figuring out how to get a set of elk antlers back on the plane or caribou or whatever you're hunting and then the meat too. Um, Lots of guys that go on these trips, they don't bring much, if any, of it back. So they just want the outfitter to handle all that and send it back. But um, myself personally, I bring everything as check baggage so um i'll give you guys a couple stories so when we went to alaska um when we came back we stopped by walmart got a couple blue bins um put our sheep in the blue bins and the capes duct taped them all up wrote our names and addresses on them and they just slapped a baggage label on them and checked them right through uh right to our home airport so it worked really well that way so you didn't have to de- declare that as anything special necessarily? Um, well, what we did, because since we were from out of country, was we went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, office, which is in the old airport right beside the main terminal there. And we talked to those guys, and they said, well, for those species that we had, we didn't need like any special export permits out of the United States. Um, and my buddy and I were like, you know what? I don't, tr- we don't trust our customs people at home. Just give us those export permits regardless. Yeah. So he's like, oh, all right. And, uh, he filled them out. And so we had one for a sheep and my buddy had a caribou as well. But, um, you know, if it was a bear or, um, 
a CITES animal, we would have had to get those permits no matter what. But um, when we came home, it was no problem. We just basically walked through customs and um, they said, oh, well, you've someone's obviously checked these animals because he had these export permits. So away you go kind of thing. Huh. Um, but uh, the other time that I um, tr- like went on kind of like a big uh, trip that required a lot of, you know, extra plane rides and whatnot because alaska you know once you get to anchorage that's just the first step in that journey the next one is finding the next plane that takes you out to the bush or whatever but um it was that the next hunt after that that i did that was kind of like kind of logistically challenged was in newfoundland for a uh, woodland caribou actually and um i was lucky enough to get a caribou out there and then on the way home I figured oh, I'll do the same thing. I'll put the meat in blue bins, check it on the plane. So that was all great. And uh, then we had, uh, I, was, I thought I'd put the rack in a, um, basically a hockey bag that I had with me that I carry a lot of my gear in. And, uh, and, uh, and then I was like, oh, this won't fit in here. <laughs> so <laughs> so we end, I ended up having to split the skull on it and got it in and back, luckily. And one piece but um the big nightmare on that trip though because i took all the meat home on it and the outfitter actually had uh, some freezers at his camp so we froze it all and um it was kind of like good to go and wasn't worried about it fine but uh, uh the big challenge on that was my wife and kids were um waiting for me at, at uh, out east and i was picking them up and we were just going to head home back to Alberta here and we got laid over in Toronto which is like about halfway home so I had like 12 between the suitcases and blue bins and a rifle and all the rest of it I had about 12 pieces of luggage <laughs> so oh my. yeah so we got uh, held up in Toronto overnight so I here I was uh, uh, trying to deal with 12 uh 12 pieces of luggage and I had like I think I had something like three of those uh, carts that carry your luggage at the airport yeah. and two <laughs> kids and holy man it was a it was a nightmare but uh, oh, that was probably about the only real bad experience I've had with uh, traveling uh, and hunting anyways bringing the meat back if I, if I wouldn't have brought the meat back you know it wouldn't have been that bad but um, you know I had several blue bins full of full of caribou meat and so um, that that was frozen salad at camp and did you pack any dry ice or anything in those blue bins with it or just uh no i didn't um and actually you know what i've really found and i've flown quite a few times now with meat is that once it doesn't matter where you are whether it's in houston texas or alaska once that plane's at thirty thousand feet it's so cold up there that stuff does not thaw out whatsoever um Mm. the biggest like biggest thing is when if you land and it's going to be warm at your destination you'll just want to get home as soon as possible but uh yeah i've i've uh traveled a few times with frozen capes and frozen meat and um i've never had it even begin to thaw when i like when i got home and pulled the lid open i was like oh geez this is still Hmm. frozen solid so um and like I said, I think it's really just because the plane's at, you know, 30,000 feet and it's cold up there regardless uh, time of year. So, yeah. And you guys had some uh, interesting adventures, Steve, when you were getting meat and like Jason's uh, moose back and things like that. What what lessons did you guys learn when you went to Alaska last year and what would you maybe do different in the future? Uh, it, it was pretty much all along the same, same lines of what Chris is saying here is just um... – we elected to ship some of the use the outfitter to um ship take care of the meat and ship it and it was just kind of a pain in the butt because you know communication was tough and we didn't know what was going on um but we had not wish we had done essentially what chris did there is um just freeze it because uh, they did have the option for that and throw it in boxes and take it home because it would have saved you a lot of money uh a b you would have known you got your meat back because you know, you just never know what happens when it gets shipped off with a bunch of other people's meat. Yeah, um, yeah, it would have been the way better option to go. You might not have been able to bring all of it back, um, 
just from a logistics standpoint, unless you wanted 12 blue bins to lug around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, it would have been, I think, the better option for sure. So if I, if I ever do something again, that's definitely what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, like when I was in Alaska too, I just found it was just chaos up there during hunting season. Like mm-hmm. hunters are coming and going. There's rocks laying out the side of the these regional airports and you're just like how does anybody get their stuff if they leave it here i was just like it's just anybody that has been there kind of gets it but uh um you know planes in alaska are like cars are everywhere else like there's flat people flying here and there and um it's i it's amazing to me that anyone gets their stuff back if they don't bring it home to be honest with you so um (laughs) I just I just found Alaska too. It just seemed really unorganized compared to other places I've hunted. Um, and what I mean by that is like you know anybody can hang their shingle out, and um, some guys are better than others, obviously. But uh, it just seemed like we, as the hunters that had come there, were making a lot of our own arrangements that um, typically other places the outfitter would take care of. So um, I'm not sure what you found uh steve but uh that was kind of our experience there anyway Mm -hmm. so awesome so backing up to um some of the process of you know guys who are beginning to look into a guided hunt or an outfitted hunt you know there's there's services out there so that you know you as the hunter aren't you know even having to do all of the research of finding the right guide or the right spot um, yeah. There's hunting consultants, if you will, that will sort of match the hunt you're looking for to a guide. Um, what, what, kind of just talk us through the advantages that those offer, and maybe some things to look out for if one chooses to look into um, a hunting consultant to basically place them with a guide. Yeah, no, that's a uh, that's a great uh, um, question because uh, I, I actually looked into that a little bit myself quite a few years ago just like talked to um some people actually from cabela's tags back in the day and uh i really didn't find them to be overly knowledgeable on everything like they never had they were generalists but like they could find you a outfit to hunt with but they didn't necessarily know that you know outfitter a and this region this is great he's this and this and i been there and you know they just really did they weren't knowledgeable about that specific hunt they were trying to sell um but then other um consultants they only book for a handful of outfits and are very knowledgeable with what you're getting into um when you go with them so that's kind of one thing to really be wary of is are you booking with just like a i'm going to call it more or less a travel agency or are you booking with uh um, a consultant that really knows what he's sending you into. Um, and actually I do a little bit of freelance, uh, consulting for the Magnum Hunt Club a little bit as well, just for, for a couple of trips. But, um, you know, I, I see a big difference between kind of what they do and what, uh, say like a Cabela's tags type, type of service does. So, um, the one thing you can tell though, is if they're just trying to sell you something, they probably don't know as much about that outfit um as what some of these other places do Mm -hmm. so i guess some of those same questions we talked about earlier that we need to ask when looking for a guide we should be you know peppering these hunting consultants with those questions and making sure that they can come up with legit answers and aren't just fumbling over a sales yeah yeah like if if they can tell you that they've been there and that their experience was x y and z you know, that means something, but if they're just like, oh, this is a good outfit or that's a good outfit based on a customer ratings kind of thing, um, you know, that's not, to me, it's a night and day difference. Like if the guy can actually say, yeah, down this fork in the drainage, uh, they got this cabin and it's set up and this is where we found our moose and this is, you know, if, if they actually have some real knowledge, then, uh, then that's probably a guy that you could book with and if if it's more or less like oh this is a good region and this guy's got a good reputation you know it might work out great but the guy you're booking with really doesn't uh understand the area or what he's sending you into so yeah 
So one more option that I kind of see out there um, is uh, this uh, availability essentially of cancellation hunts. Can you kind of explain what those is, how that process works, and uh, again, kind of the pros and cons of maybe looking at that method to book a hunt? So cancellation hunts are, to me, like the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, everybody and their dog goes to these shows and says, put me on your cancellation list, put me on your cancellation list. And uh, like I said, I've got several friends that are guides and own outfits and whatnot. And most of them have the same story. Like we got to call 15 people before anyone – or maybe a hundred people before uh, they find someone that was on their cancellation list. It's actually serious. Um, like what I would recommend for someone that's serious about doing one of these hunts, but maybe doesn't have the money just to write the big check and um, go whenever they want um, is to figure out what you want to hunt, where you want to hunt it and who you want to hunt it with. So if you're looking for, a doll sheep in the Mackenzie mountains. And that is your dream hunt of a lifetime. You know, there's really only two or three, um, outfitters that, uh, provide that hunt. Um, pick the one that you really want to go with, give the guy a call up and say, look, um, put me on your cancellation list and I'll give you a couple thousand dollars to be the first guy that you call. Um, like, or put it like a small deposit, like a couple thousand dollars down and say, I'm going with you, but call me, I'm the first guy when this cancellation comes up and I could almost guarantee you'll be the first guy they call every time. Cause that shows you're serious. Um, the only downside is at that point you are committed to going with that outfit. So choose wisely, but, um, I bet you, um, uh, of all the guys I know, there's hardly a one that doesn't have at least one cancellation a year. Mm -hmm. So, the, the the chance to go on one is is great. You just have to make sure that your schedule is extremely flexible as well, though. Um, like if you need to give your boss two weeks notice before you go on holidays or more, um, it might be tough because some of these trips, um, they're literally a guy dropped out. Uh, you If you can come Monday morning, you know, there's a spot for you kind of thing. So uh, the more flexible you can be, the better off you are as well. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I've, there's two or three places I really would like to go and that I'm buddies with uh, the operators. And the one guy has called me um, every year for the last couple of years. And it's usually the same story. Like, oh, I had a couple doctors that were coming up this or next week. Uh, they just phoned me today and said they're not coming and they lost all their money. Do you want to come up and just go hunting? And um there's basically if you're ready to go, there's some great deals to be had out there. So, yeah. So this will obviously vary based upon the species and timing and all kinds of things, but what, like what kind of money can be saved by going on a cancellation hunt and not necessarily um, a dollar amount, but say like 25% or 50% or, um, I've seen, um, some hunts up to, uh, easily 75% off. Wow. Um, yeah, like a, a sheep hunt in particular, um, easy 75% off if it's last minute. So, um, you know, because usually what happens is you have so much time to pay for these trips before the date. And if a guy um, opts out within a two to four weeks of going, they're not getting any, any of their money back. So, um, yeah, you, you can you can save a lot. Oh, I, I would say huh. easily... At a minimum, I would say at least if they if they're not going to give you at least twenty five to fifty percent off at a minimum, I would pass it up. Yeah, and um, I guess at that point too, there's maybe no harm in sort of counter offering, if you will. Like, yeah, I oh, can make yeah. it for you know fifty percent off, but not twenty five. Yeah, for sure. And the the only time they wouldn't go for it is if um, whoever they booked uh, say didn't give them that much money down and never made any. Um, didn't pay for the trip basically and they really can't sell it for any less right. than they're asking but nine times out of ten you can you can really go for pennies on the dollar so hmm. um but like i said it, you have to be ready to go at a moment's notice usually and 
whatnot and have a pretty flexible schedule but if you do man it's it's the way to go on a trip of a lifetime yeah so seems like a pretty decent option to get on that list if you i don't know say like run a pack company or something steve could just take- <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like, yeah i can get out of the office for a week yeah <laughs> Of course, yeah. I say that, and it's like the busiest time of the year for you. Yeah. So, of course, yeah, I'm be August first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I guess with the pack business, it's probably uh, pretty seasonal for the most part. So. Yeah, yeah. Summers are definitely crazy. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about you know we we've planned this hunt and uh, our proverbial hunter has made all the arrangements. The time comes to hunt, they get to the destination, and from there. You know, maybe there's this idea that it's all just uh, the outfitter pampering the hunter, but talk a little bit about the mindset the hunter should have, the expectations that they should have going into it, and really the part that they still have to play. Like, they're not just there as some diva to be cared for, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's uh, That's an interesting topic. A really good friend of mine's a uh, uh, sheep guide. And he's had the whole gamut of the guy that wants to show up to camp and just bring me up the mountain when you find my ram to, um, you know, the guy that is hunting with them just like their two buddies on the mountain, um, you know, both doing equally the same amount of work. But my personal – and I've told lots of guys this that that are going on these – or plan on going on these trips is – to do whatever you can to help your guide or the wrangler or whoever it is. So, um, you know, if that means doing dishes, yeah, sure, you don't have to do them. That's what you paid these guys for. But that's going to make those guys' job that much easier. Um, It's going to allow them to uh, get a few other things done. Um, You know, uh, the other thing you can do, like, you know, if they're saddling horses – uh, you can take the brush and just brush them down before they put the saddles on. That saves you five minutes. Um, anything you can do to help your guys out, because you you're in it together. It doesn't matter if you paid or not. Um, you know, if you aren't helping out, you're basically, in my opinion, losing hunting time. So whether that's chopping firewood, helping out making a meal here and there, um, fetching some water, Um, whatever it is, wherever you can help out, you're just going to have a better hunt. And you know what? Those guides appreciate it too, because they're, they're used to clients that are showing up and, you know, pull out the lawn chair, put their feet up and they're waiting on these guys hand and foot. And, you know, there's clients that do that uh, on a regular basis. But if you're in there and you're helping those guys and treating them like human beings and not just like a servant, um, they're going to work extra hard for you as well. So being a decent human being goes a long way. So, <laughs> yeah. So, what about? Um, and again, I know this varies, but just to help give us an idea, the hunt goes down and times up, and a tag goes unfilled. Um, you know, I've seen different sort of formal and informal policies on an unsuccessful hunt and what a guide might offer. Um, in that scenario kind of talk us through what you've seen and experienced and what one um might expect or um should at least consider maybe even when booking a guide based on such policies yeah um so if i would say probably 95 um plus percent of outfits will tell you excuse me um your hunt is your hunt if you don't get something well that's hunting um but uh, from what from the, all the guys that I've talked to and um, just my own experience, um, if you go and you are an active participant and you are trying your hardest with the guide and you don't have an opportunity, they will usually bring you back um, if they're in any kind of outfit at all. Sometimes uh, they don't have um, an option to do that, to, like if it's – Um, say like a sheep or whatever, like usually their tags are sold out well ahead of time, but, uh, um, usually they will get you an opportunity, uh, to to at least take a shot. If you've had an opportunity or two on the trip and you just weren't able to get something, um, you know, they might cut, they tip, well, I shouldn't say they might, they typically would cut the guy a break and, uh, 
bring him back for a discounted rate the following year. So, um, now that being said, uh, like I was talking about treating people like decent human beings, um, I know a few um, guys that have not been so decent and uh, – the outfitter basically says pay full price or you're not coming back. So, you know, it's really, um, there's no one hard and fast rule, but it's, you know, the more you can build your relationships with these people, um, the better deal you're probably going to get yourself at the end of the day. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's kind of been my experience anyways with, uh, with things and with the uh, guys I've talked to. Yeah. So one more point or question I had on sort of our responsibility or the part we play as hunters is, uh, the whole idea of tipping, um, mm-hmm. and how that's handled for, you know, the outfitter and supporting staff. And again, I don't think there's like a rule here, but just kind of talk us through your experiences and what you've seen, um, and what, you know, the guides that, you know, uh, kind of what are they looking for? Are they expecting it? Just give us a feel for that whole arrangement. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a, this is a really hotly debated topic and I've had a lot of people ask me like what the rule is. Is it a percentage? Um, is it a set amount? Is it a max? And I just, you know, most guys I talk to, it's like, okay, if it's a percentage, just think about that for a minute. Say it's, say the magic number is 5%. If that trip of a lifetime cost you forty or $50,000 at 5%, that's a lot of tip money yeah. <laughs> at the end of it, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess if the, I guess people that are paying that kind of money for those trips, maybe they can afford it. But, uh, um, yeah, it's I've and the guides that I've talked to, you know, they've said they've got everything from gear and no cash to cash and gear to cash, but you know, there it really depends on the uh, price of the hunt for I'd say the max that uh, people are giving, but um, I'll, also the quality of service too so like if a guy was terrible um i tell people you know a tip is for exceptional service it's not for standard service and it's not just an automatic give me so if the guy was like terrible and you were picking up 85 percent of the slack and you found your own animals and he didn't even pack it (laughs) out for you you know maybe you don't give him anything right Um, Mm -hmm. but if the guy was like you know doing double time for you every day and um, helped you really be successful and was packing your sheep off the mountain in the middle of a blizzard, yeah, you know, maybe it's uh, worth giving them a little extra if you have it. But um, yeah, I've, I know uh, I've, I don't want to say a set number, but uh, like I know like on a caribou hunt in Newfoundland, I've heard uh, the rule I think was something like, 200 for the guide and 100 for the cook or something like that so that's probably on the lower end but they're doing a volume business there um like on a sheep hunt uh, my one friend that's a guide in bc there he's gotten as much as two thousand dollars so um i think the i think the range is all over the map it's really what mm. uh what the um hunter can afford and what he feels like he got for service but uh but then on the other hand uh the same buddy in bc there he's been given gifts um like a 3500 hundred dollar para like a binoculars so you know <laughs> like the guy bought him for the trip and he's like oh here you go i'm getting a new pair next year and <laughs> um you know so there's you know there's intangible things like that and i know some of these guys too um, especially in the sheep hunting world, like it's a pretty small community. And, uh, you know, this one guy that I know in particular, he's had people from Florida bring him down there in the wintertime to spend a month with them at their uh, place, hanging out by the pool kind of thing. So wow. um, there's lots of like little fringe and perk benefits that uh, that people give out to. But I'd say the average guy is probably looking at, you know, probably a cash tip i would i would think but uh yeah 
That's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So are there yeah. are there any other topics we didn't cover or anything that comes to mind just from a I, I know there's a lot more to talk about for but from a very high level for guys who are just sort of interested in maybe someday or just exploring getting into <clears throat> a guided or an outfitted hunt. Anything that pops yep. out that we didn't cover? Yeah, um the one thing that I would recommend is like the first um, outfitted hunt I did was a huge trip and it was Alaska. That is the wrong trip to start out with. Um, the trip you want to start out with is do like an antelope hunt, do a black bear hunt, do something small. Um, figure out what question, like, you know, you, you think, you know, you think you've asked all the right questions. You think you've, um, did all your homework but what you're going to find is when you go on your first trip with one of these outfits, there's going to be things that come up that like, oh, next time I'm going to ask about this, and next time I'm going to uh, ask about that. And um, start small, um, figure out the logistics of actually traveling with your firearm or your bow or whatnot, because that's a whole different uh, that's a whole different ball of wax too than just throwing your gun in the truck and heading out. Um, there's a lot of little things that you don't really think about when you go on your first uh, um, guided hunt, I guess. So I would rec- definitely recommend do something small that's affordable. And then if you do get completely burnt, it's not like you lost the lost the mm-hmm. family farm kind of thing. So yeah, yeah that's, that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. You almost know. make a practice run and still get to chase something. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? Uh, I tell people all the time to a really great first. Um, outfitted hunt is do a caribou um it is I, I i just really enjoy hunting them i don't know why it's there it's not that hard of a hunt to start with your odds of success are extremely high and it is a true adventure like where you have to travel to go to get these things is a ton of logistics and um you know a ton of plane changes and um that'll really give you a good um, feel for what's involved in it and they're not that expensive a, of a trip all things considered that's so. yeah <laughs> we might have to talk offline about that one <laughs> well yeah, yeah, we definitely we, <laughs> well we definitely should yeah <laughs> that, yeah that yeah 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 because actually I've, I've organized uh a group trip for eight of us just through my office for none of it, uh, in 2018 for caribou. And then, uh, I've been asked to organize another one for possibly Quebec here. So yeah, definitely talk offline if you want after about it. So cool. Very cool. So we appreciate the time. I just got to know, you know, given the experiences that you've had both with your, you know, your DIY hunting and even the guided hunting, just, you know, it's it's another level to hunt in sheep country. And as you mentioned, you kind of learned the hard way from a gear perspective. Just a few highlights of some of the lessons you've learned or some of the gear items that have proven invaluable over the years for you. Oh, man. Um, I know there's a bunch. I know we're yeah. like running on time, but just some of the highlights. Okay. Like I'd say the top three or four things, uh, the right pack for you Um that is absolutely critical. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's a handful of high end backpacks out there. Um, I've kind of run through almost all of them at this point, just trying them and seeing what I like best, but certain ones, you know, I absolutely hate the harnesses on, but my buddy, that was the best fitting pack he ever put on for him. Um, you just want to make sure that the packs are made with a good quality, like good quality, and when you got weight in it, it carries properly on your frame, like on your body. Um, so that's probably um, probably one of the key pieces there. Uh, second, but not really a second, is uh, boots. Um, having Investing in a good pair of mountain boots is um, just a lifesaver. Like I, I didn't realize how big of a difference that made until I actually um, got a pair of good proper mountain boots um you know i went from having blisters after every trip to i haven't had a blister since i've got these boots so um that's a huge huge uh 
thing there. Yeah, I know um, that's very personal as well because everybody has different feet. It, but just, it, it, but what exactly. is your uh, boot of choice out of curiosity? Um, mine is the Handwag Alaska GTX. Okay. And that's kind of similar to, I think, a Kenetrex or a lower, similar to those, but um, yeah. just fits my foot perfect and i've never had any issues with them gotcha. um yeah but my buddy uh, that i actually went to alaska with there he had them um they weren't wide enough for him he had blisters all the time with them but he got a pair of i think i think it was the uh, kenetrex and they fit him perfect so like you said it's a very personal choice mm-hmm. just make sure you have a good quality boot that's not gonna fall apart on you yeah um, so that'd be my second piece of gear. Uh, the third, uh, third and fourth would be, um, a good set of, uh, rain gear and, um, a, some kind of a good shelter, whether it's a bivy sack or a tent or a whatever, um, man, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. And what and, are your preferences there as well? Oh, the tents. Um, I uh, don't like the weight, but the Hillebergs I really like. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I've tried a, quite a few different ones like the MSRs and and whatnot, but man, that Hilleberg, I've, um, my, my one uh, friend that guides there, he bought one for himself personally, and I, I don't think there's a better three season tent that I've tried for backpacking anyway. But like I said, it's probably pound, pound and a half heavier than what maybe something equivalent in an MSR might be. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, just way more comfortable and way more rainproof and just seem to be, uh, worth the wait. Yeah, definitely worth it. Yeah. yeah. Being comfortable is nice when it's miserable out. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, how about your you guys? What are you guys running for tents? Kind of all over. I know Steve, you're yeah. a Hilleberg fan, and have you mm-hmm. know, depend on the season. I mean, um, like this year, you know, we were in September archery season. We were running a, a floorless uh, tent from uh, Seek Outside. Um, kind of a kind of a teepee style shelter, but you know, it's yeah. obviously we weren't in sheep country either. <laughs> yeah. I've been looking at those, uh, teepee tents from C actually from seek there. I've been tempted to try them out. I, I did have, a um, kind of like a cheap, uh, teepee tent that, uh, was made of t- just like basically tarp that you'd find mm-hmm. at any store. And, um, man, I sure liked how easy it was to set up and yeah, it mm-hmm. just seemed like, but like you say, you got to have a, spot that's flat that you can't really pitch it on a incline at all so right um yeah yeah it's the second year we've used that for uh for elk season and it's worked out really well for us yeah yeah you just seem to have a you you know you can't really stand up a whole lot in them but uh they just seem to have a lot of square footage on the ground that's covered it seems like for yeah for what you get and yeah whatnot so yeah for sure yeah. Well, Chris, we are uh, we are at some time, man. We so appreciate uh, taking the time that you did, and just you know, there's there's so much knowledge in here that I'm sure guys are gonna reap the rewards of as they look to, you know, doing a guided hunt, whether that's next year, even in you know five, ten years down the road. It's it's super valuable just to to get a taste of what we what we need to know and look for. Yeah, no, for sure, and uh, you know, the one thing too that um a lot of people think is that if you go on a guided trip that like you said it's a give me and that it's expensive and it's these rich guys wanting to guarantee a trophy it doesn't have to be like that and it doesn't have to be expensive so you know just figure out what you really want to go after and look at all your options and you know there's usually the average i would say the average guy can harvest at least one of every species type in North America um, if you have an average job. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be, um, you know, an engineer. Um, you just have to pick what you want to go after, focus on it, and uh, work towards that uh, goal, I guess. Well, I think that is a great place to leave this episode. 
Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, you can send your questions, comments, or feedback to us at podcast at exomountaingear.com. Also, a big shout out to Rusty Truman. You were this week's Exo Mountain Gear swag winner. If you can send us your address to podcast at exomountaingear.com, we'll be sure to send you out some goodies. Listeners, if you want to get in on these giveaways, it's really simple. Just we appreciate those iTunes reviews. Or if you can't do that, again, just email us with your questions, comments, or feedback. We just love to hear from you. So until next time, guys, great episodes coming up. Happy hunting. Hope you can get, can get outdoors. We will catch you for the next episode.